Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is the first of a two-part City Talk on education. I'm confused. In September, the New York City Department of Education won the prestigious Broad Prize in Urban Education. The department had demonstrated, quote, overall performance and improvement in student achievement while reducing the achievement gap among poor and minority students. Two months later, in mid-November, the 2007 National Assessment of Educational Progress Test showed, as the New York Times headlined it, little progress for city schools on national tests. Racial gap continues. I'm confused. To help clarify what can only be described as Twain's lies, damn lies, and statistics of educational policy and politics is Diane Ravitch. Ms. Ravitch is research professor of education at New York University and a senior fellow at the Brookings and Hoover institutions. Professor Ravitch served both the first President Bush and the Clinton administrations. She is the author of eight books, including the classic Great School Wars and most recently, The Language Police, How Pressure Groups Restrict What Students Learn. Welcome, Diane. Great to be with you, Doug. Elucidate me. How do we win this prestigious broad prize, the Department of Education, and how do the recently released tests show that we're not moving? Well, uh, I guess the easy, easiest way to explain it is that there's a big difference between the state test and the national test. The national test is a barometer. It's, given, it's been given since 2002 in New York City. So we have the test for 2002, 2003, 5, and 7. The baseline data. It's a baseline data test, and it's given to 11 cities across the country as well as to every state and to the nation. So we can compare ourselves as to how we've done. Um, the state test, which is given uh, regularly every year to, to all the cities and all the students across the state, uh, has had fluctuating standards. Uh, the state test, according to federal studies, is a much easier test than the NAEP test. Uh, the state claims proficiency for a majority of students, somewhere in the range of about 75 percent of the students in the state are proficient. Uh, but on the NAEP test, which is the national test, uh, it's only about 30-something percent. So there's a huge difference. The, the national test is a hard test. It's a, um, a very consistent test. The state test, uh, various studies have shown, most recently one uh, reported by the Daily News, right. Uh, the, the state test has gotten easier over time. Right. Aaron Einhorn, an excellent uh, education reporter for the Daily News, wrote an, uh, an analysis of the data which showed that as the tests got easier, the scores rose. This, of course. This is not brain surgery, but right. in fact, these tests are getting easier. Now, what is the political imperative behind these higher scores and these easier tests? Well, there's a good reason why the tests are getting easier, and it's not just New York State. It's a lot of states across the country are making lowering their standards standards and making their test easier, it's because of the national law, the federal law called No Child Left Behind, which requires every state to uh, have 100 percent proficiency by the year 2014. Now, I can tell you this will not happen. It will not happen in my lifetime or, or the lifetime of my grandchildren. It will not happen, period. There are too many reasons why kids are not going to be proficient, having to do with poverty, non-English speaking, special ed, a million different things. It's not going to happen. But nonetheless, the states are required to have 100 percent proficiency, though, so they have all filed plans with the U.S. Department of Education saying we will meet this goal. So New York State is meeting its goal and the tests are easier. So New York City seems to be getting better as New York State seems to be getting better, but in fact the tests are easier. So along comes the federal test, which is called NAEP, the National Education, National Assessment of Education Progress, and found that there has been, during the years of the Klein-Bloomberg regime, 
uh, no gains in reading, not in fourth grade and not in eighth grade, no gains in eighth grade math, and the only significant, statistically significant improvement was in fourth grade math. Okay, now wait a second. This really is confusing. The press release from the Department of Education on these tests, first sentence, New York City students made impressive gains on the 2007 National Assessment of Educational Progress Test. I mean, is this all well? What is this? Is this all um, well? I think that the uh, Department of Education was just hugely embarrassed by the poor showing. I don't think they expected that the NAEP would show that they made zero gains. Uh, they've been mounting a $10 million PR campaign on television and bus stop shelters and print media everywhere to say the s scores are higher than ever. Now the net federal test shows that the, the scores haven't changed one iota in reading and for the eighth grade uh, math. So I think that the press release is indicative, indicative of, I guess, uh, they just want to put a gloss on what is really very bad news for the New York City. Um, and they're just spinning it. Uh, they have a huge communications department over there, uh, unlike previous chancellors. And uh, they, they, um, they don't have a research department. That's the, for me, as a scholar, I find this very upsetting. Instead of doing research and telling us what the facts are, they have the PR people working over the data to look for nuggets of good news. Ooh, that's a pretty sharp charge. And, and in sure. exchange with uh, David Cantor of the uh, DOE and uh, Gadfly, you, you're quoted as saying, the mayor's accomplishments owe more to press strategy than education strategy. It, this, I mean, you're saying this is all spin and all, I mean, they're fooling all these folks? Um, I think that uh, they probably accomplished some good things, although, you know, right now, at, at this moment, I'd be hard to identify one of them. I think that I'm, you know, I'm glad that they broke up some of the really bad uh, large schools, but even there with the small schools data, they have been challenged as, as to the uh, veracity of the data on the small schools. Now, as I read the report and summaries of, of, of the NAEP report, it showed that Eighth grade reading and math showed no statistically significant improvement, either overall or with minorities, mm -hmm. and the same with fourth grade reading. But the math scores showed significant improvement. So there's, 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 there's some positive here, no? Or are well, you telling me that this is another? There, you know, it, it, they may have, there may have been some improvement in fourth grade math just due to the fact that there is a single citywide math curriculum. It's called everyday math, and that in itself is quite controversial, it's just as it happens this week. Um, the state of Texas uh, said rejected everyday math for purchase by any of their school districts. So it's a controversial curriculum, but it seems to have produced gains. Uh, on the other hand, I got an email from a, a statistician yesterday telling me to pay attention to the technical stuff with, with NAEP, because it turns out that the percentage of kids in New York City who were given special accommodations, extra time, extra help, on the fourth grade math was 25%, which was double the rate that had gotten accommodations okay. in earlier assessments and much higher than in any other city. So it may be that some of that rise is attributed to the very dramatic increase in the number of kids getting extra time. But we did win this broad prize, and it is prestigious, and it's got you know a sterling cast of reviewers, et cetera. How did we win it and, and get this glowing statement of improvement and uh, just to go on further from, from my intro, greater overall performance and improvement, greater subgroup performance, closing achievement gaps, more African-American and Hispanic students achieving at high levels. I don't well, understand the disjuncture between the data that these folks must have looked at, unless it's based, as you said, on the state test and the national test. I, I believe it could only be based on the state test because if you looked at the national test two years ago, uh, it was also true that New York City had not made any significant gains at that two years ago with the national test. So I, they must have decided just to look only at the state data and to take it seriously because if you look at the national data, there have been no gains uh, mm -hmm. in closing the achievement gap. And Hispanic students in New York City are behind Hispanic students in many other cities. We're doing, the Hispanic kids in New York City are doing much worse. So there's been no ch closing of the achievement gaps for black or Hispanic students if you, if you take the federal data seriously, and I do. I think it's a, a I was on, served on that board for seven years. I know it's a good test. Okay. Let's move to you being in the crosshairs of the Department of Education. Mm -hmm. You're at the top of the enemies list. Uh, let's start with, let's just start with the, the back and forth between you and Kathy Wilde of the, the New York City Partnership that appeared on the pages of the New York Post, Kathy's piece on 
October 30th, characterizing you as hypocritical critic and your response an unfair attack. Talk about the controversy. Talk about the roots of the controversy and the outcome of the controversy. Uh, sure. Well, first of all, I don't really have any issue with Kathy Wild. I don't, I don't really know Kathy Wild. I think I met her one time. And, and I do believe that uh, as a person uh, representing the business community, uh, she didn't write the article. She was uh, asked to write it. Yeah, it was reported by the Gotham Gazette and the New York Sun, New York Sun first, that they, in fact they, the DOE compiled a dossier on you, followed you around, yeah. and, and helped well, ghostwrite this piece. What, what's a little bit, uh, to me, frightening about this whole episode is, uh, as I said, I had no issue with Kathy Wilde, or with the business community for that matter. Um, the, the, as I understood the facts that emerged after she wrote this, or somebody wrote this article, um, first of all, the Department of Education compiled a dossier of my views, uh, used this dossier to say I've changed my mind about things that they don't think I should have changed my mind about. But you and did change your mind. In and some well, cases, I have. Right. We'll I, talk I changed, about that. I we'll change my mind things. every day on all sorts of things. Right. Okay. I mean, and that's I, not necessarily a bad right. thing. Right. I mean, I'm an academic. I'm a scholar. I write things. And then later I look back and I say, well, gee, it didn't work out in practice. I was wrong. I changed my mind. But you know, Joel Klein changes his mind. He reorganized the system in 2003 and completely reorganized it three years later and never even said he was changing his mind. So changing your mind is something that you do when you, when you say, I was wrong. He never said he was wrong. I'm willing to say on any number of things uh, that I was wrong. I oh. think, but I don't want to get into that right now. What I want to get into is the attack itself. Uh, I got an email chain that uh, showed me that that article came from a public relations firm, the Howard Rubenstein firm, direct to the New York Post. So that's why I say I don't know who wrote it. Right. Uh, I assume it was written in either by the DOE, somewhat there, or in the Howard Rubenstein's office. Uh, I learned from the New York Sun the day after her attack appeared uh, that the DOE had compiled a dossier mm -hmm. on me. And then uh, I responded. What I forgot to mention in my response was that uh, the DOE had, he had been following me from speech to speech whenever I would lecture about the New York City reforms, sending somebody from the communications office to tape record me. Obviously, they thought what you said was important. Well, uh, I was usually giving the same speech, but just adding in the last series of changes right. and, and, and amendations and the last changes of mine. But someone would be there, and it happened at NYU, it happened at St. John's College, uh, it happened when I lectured to the, the Parent Advisory Council, and, uh, you know, the first time I thought, well, I guess they just want to keep it on file. The second time I thought it was strange. And the third time I began to get really uneasy about why were they following me and taping me. And, yeah, I guess I'm at the top of their enemies list. But I asked myself, why should they have an enemies list? Good question. Okay, let's get to the substance of the, the, the initial piece and, and your response. The initial piece was triggered over the issue of merit pay. You had written an op-ed piece in the Daily News some days prior saying that, you know, the wise guys at the Ed Department had gotten rolled by Randy Weingarten and mm -hmm. it wasn't really merit pay. And then you, you were attacked here uh, by Wild by saying that you, you flipped your position on it. And also, and this is down the road a bit, the reversals seem more tied to unhappiness with the personalities in the Bloomberg administration than its policies. It went back from sort of a, an analytical attack to an ad hominem attack. Mm -hmm. talk, talk, talk to the merit pay issue. Let's talk substance for a bit. Well, I have to say that merit pay has not been something that I have been deeply engaged in in one way or another. For, so for them to make a big deal about you've changed your position, I may have written it once in an, an op-ed or maybe twice over the course of 500 articles uh, that pay should be linked to performance. Now, performance could mean uh, serving in a, an inner city school, being a math and science teacher where there are shortages. It can mean doing extra work. There are all kinds of ways to define performance. I don't have any problem with that. What I said in the Daily News op-ed was that the, the city got rolled by the union because the city wanted a merit pay plan where one teacher was paid more than the teacher in the next classroom because one teacher got a higher test scores and the other one didn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the agreement was one that was a school-wide bonus plan that it could include secretaries, uh, counselors, people who didn't teach regular classroom subjects. And I pointed out this is exactly what the union wanted. So in effect, the city uh, got taken to the cleaners by the union. Well, that must have made them very angry. They don't like criticism. They like everybody to just be 
cheerleading them and saying how wonderful they are. So uh, someone wrote, you drew upon my dossier, uh, wrote an article, and it was published in the New York Post. Now, how did you, what was the, what was the story with the Post? Did you know that, that Wilde's piece was going to come out? And did they, they, they talk to you beforehand and ask you for a response? Just talk about the sort of the backroom dynamics sure. of what happened. Um, I got a call about uh, 6 o'clock the night before the piece appeared from the op-ed editor uh, at the Post saying there's going to be a personal attack on you in tomorrow's paper. And he described it as a personal attack. Right. Okay. And he said you'll have an opportunity to respond. So... Uh, then the, the, the that post piece came out. Lots of people emailed me about how outraged they outraged they were. And well, of course, it was on it was on the, the blogs. It was on Daily Kaz. It was on uh, the National Review. There were a lot of right, blogging. A lot of, a lot of blogs this. were all, all over this. Uh, but the next the day after that, the New York Sun ran a story saying uh, the DOE had not only had a hand in it, they were proud of it. They they thought it was really terrific that they were able to get this article printed and that they drew upon a dossier. And apparently they had been shopping this dossier around to the press to try to damage my reputation. Um, so knowing all of this, I then was able to respond uh, two days later, I think it was November 1st in the Post, and say, uh, this is ridiculous. You know, uh, I have a, I'm, a, I'm not a, a public official. I'm not an elected official. Uh, I wasn't sworn to uh, follow whatever the policy line of the DOE is. And for that matter, I'm not even sworn to, to uh, say exactly today what I said a week ago or a month ago or um, 10 years ago. So this idea that it's outrageous that I've changed my mind. I change my mind all the time. I change my mind about what I'm going to have for dinner tonight. Uh, why do I owe an apology to the Department of Education if I change my view about any number of issues? Okay. In, in, a, in a back and forth between David Cantor and yourself in, in June. I mean, your history with going back and forth with mm -hmm. the DOE has, has a history, in fact. Right. You write, and I want to sort of quote this extensively. You say, by now, independent observers of the Bloomberg administration's education program, dash, dash, that is those who do not work for the administration, whose universities do not have multi-million dollar contracts with the administration, whose organization do not receive grants from the Bloomberg Foundation, who are not themselves on the mayor's private pay Payroll, you're, you're saying that there is this 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 mass of institutions that are aligned with the mayor, and you're more than suggesting that they're bought off in some way. You know, the mayor called a press conference last spring where he brought forward a hundred people who signed a petition saying you're doing the right thing, and he got laughed at in the press and on the blogs because everybody standing behind him had a contract with him, with the DOE, with the city, with the Bloomberg Foundation. They were all in one way or another on the payroll. Uh, I'm, I get called a lot by the media. I mean, I, I've been writing about the New York City schools now for I, well over 40 years, uh, 40 years. But I get called a lot and they ask me questions and I'll say, look, you have called me too often, call someone else and they'll say, You're no, the only one. no one else will speak. Oh, and okay. they say, they'll say, I have a million, the reporters will say, people tell me stuff off the record. I need someone who will go on the record. And I'll say, but I can't be the only one. And they all say, but nobody else will go on the record. Hmm. So that's why I end up being in a controversy with them because, hey, at my age, and I don't have tenure, but... I, you said it NYU. Come I'm not, on. You know, I know, I know this stuff, and they can, if they want to say I'm wrong, let them say I'm wrong, but why attack me personally? Okay. In your response on November 1st, titled An Unfair Attack, I want to quote again. I used to think that nothing could be worse than the old Board of Education, but I was wrong. After two top-to-bottom reorganizations of the school system in four years, I've come to see that there is virtue and stability, especially for schools which are communities. You supported the original uh, Albany effort to hand the schools over to the mayor, right. to put them under mayoral control. What, what went wrong here? I mean, well, I, I mean to say that the, the old Board of Ed might have been better than the current Department of Education is astounding. I mean, because... It, it, it was. It was. And, and let me just go back a second, because, you know, I'm a historian, and my first book was The History of the New York City Schools. And... Excuse me, by the way, I used that in the very first New York City class I taught at Baruch in 1980, The Great School Wars. Well, thank you. It, it's still, you know, it's still a good book. It still works. It needs to be have the last yes, it does. 35 I was years getting, filled but, in. Well, right? it's, that's what we're going to talk about subsequently, but go but ahead. The typical form of governance in New York City since the 1840s has been 
mayoral control. I mean, people think that Bloomberg taking over the schools was some kind of incredible thing that never happened before, except for the previous, except for that period from 1969 to 2002 when we had decentralization. Mm -hmm. at a t and that was when we had seven people on the Board of Education, two of them chosen by the mayor, the other five chosen by borough presidents. So nobody was in charge, basically. Right. But previous to 1969, the most typical form of governance was mayoral control, where the mayor selected every single member of the Board of Education. Now, even the leaderless Board of Education, as it existed, was preferable to what we have now. And I'm, explain. Okay, I'll explain. Because this is hard to believe for many yeah, of us. What I, what I didn't re see coming, and I mean, I was wrong. I'm, I'm willing to admit I was wrong. Okay, it's okay. a mea culpa. Okay. Okay, mea culpa was the secrecy in which policy would be created. And it started from the beginning. Uh, the mayor chose a non-educator. Okay, there are other cities that have chosen non-educators. He brought in teams of people, would not tell who was on his teams. The, the Department of Education had to be foiled, Freedom of Information Act, just to find out who was advising him. And that didn't come out until much later. And he selected, with no input from the public, a math curriculum and a reading curriculum, and made which was it. very controversial. And, and the and the and the, uh, the deputy super uh, chancellor was very controversial. Right, and he brought in someone who had no experience in New York City as the top educator. Okay, his choice, but we now know four years later that the reading curriculum was a disaster because there have been no gains in four years for any group of students. The math curriculum appears to have been successful. That's good. My problem was not, it, first of all, I had a problem with the actual curriculum choices, especially mm -hmm. in reading, because I thought he, sh I didn't think that the Department of Education should be telling every teacher in the city that there's only one right way to teach. I thought that was wrong. Yeah, I've described it on this show as Stalinist, but go yeah, ahead. Yeah, well, okay. Having been a, a public, a New York City public well, school teacher. What the teachers call it, what the teachers called it was micromanagement. Okay, and there well, were very, nice term. there were very successful teachers who said, you know, I got great results every year teaching second grade. And then they come in and say, change everything you're doing. You could only use the DOE approach, the Department of Education approach. You have to change over to the teacher's college workshop model. And so you have to throw out everything you've done that succeeded. Uh, so I got really upset about this idea that they had, first of all, except for the math, they had no curriculum. And I met several times with the chancellor to say, you can't test when you don't have a curriculum. But he didn't understand that. He didn't know the difference between curriculum and, and pedagogy. Pedagogy being mm -hmm. how to teach, curriculum right. being what to teach. Right. So there this was no... A, this is a pretty fundamental distinction. Yeah, but he, he didn't get that. So, what, so for the first three years, they were doing micromanagement. Every classroom had to have a rug and a rocker. The bulletin boards had to be just so. You had to use the Lucy Calkins workshop model from Teachers College, and the Teachers College trainers came in to tell you exactly how to teach. And it just seemed not the way to go. And that really upset me was the micromanagement because I strongly believe that, um, that it's okay to have a curriculum because that way at least everybody knows what fourth graders are supposed to have learned. But teachers should teach in the way that they think best. So that was a big problem for me. But again, the larger problem was that the secrecy was indicative of the style in which this new form of government would operate. That is with no public discussion no review, no consultation, uh, no standing up in front of the board and explain and asking, uh, does this look like a good plan? And then being told, no, it's not a good plan, go back. But rather, here's the plan, you take it. Not take it or leave it, but take it. Right. Uh, you've said that this is public education without the public. Right. Yes. I uh, early on wrote an, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times with Randy Weingarten, and, and at the time, people were very surprised that I'd be writing an article with, with the head of the teacher's I, in union. In fact, I, I was surprised myself. Uh, but we, we had talked about this at length, uh, and we both agreed that public education that is done behind closed doors is not public education. You cannot... It turns out, and, and I learned something, and, and you know, I'm sorry that I supported the change as it happened. I, was, I freely admit mea culpa. Uh, there must be a board. There must be a central board that's independent of the mayor. When the mayor wanted to impose his social promotion policy, he fired two members. He asked the Staten Island president to fire another member, so they approved it. Now, in fact, it hasn't really happened. I mean, the, to the public, what they say, what they see, you have to look at it, it's like you have to be a Sovietologist today to understand what's happening. Who's the, standing next to whom? Go well, ahead. No, but what doesn't get said? Oh, okay. It's like the dog that didn't right, bark. Right. So what are they not boasting about? They're not boasting about the Leadership Academy, on which, where they brought in a telecommunications executive who knew nothing about education to train principals. They're not getting results there because they're not boasting about it. Report cards. 
That was a, a, a major issue a couple of weeks ago. They came out with these report cards. Schools were rated from A to F. You had huge Sturm und Drang, all kinds of problems, schools that were on, you know, the unsafe list and the dangerous list were getting A's, top mm -hmm. schools were getting C's. Talk about report cards in general, metrics in general, and then in the last 30 seconds of this segment, I want you to give the school system a grade and explain it. But go ahead. Okay. Um, Talk about report cards. The report cards, I think, are a disaster. Uh, I think that it's, it's crude to give a school a single letter to say you're an A school, you're a C school, you're an F school. That would make about as much sense as to give a student a report card that said you, you are a B. I mean, it doesn't make sense. It's crude. And a, and a good report card would say you did well on this, you did poorly on that, and you'd give maybe 15 different performance indicators uh, that, that would indicate to the school, to the teachers, to the parents, where they could look at it and say, this has face validity, it makes sense, this mm -hmm. looks like my school. Mm -hmm. But to take a school where everybody is dying to get their kids into and where the parents are very happy and say this is a D or an F school doesn't make sense. To take a school that's on the state's list of persistently dangerous schools and say this is an A school, how crazy there's a, is yeah, that? There's a, there's a cognitive disconnect. dissonance right. here. Is it, is it the measures that are used or it's, is it the measurement itself that's problematic? Well, I think that uh, they just didn't get it right. I mean, the, the guy who's the head of assessment accountability is a very esteemed law professor from Columbia University Law School. And I'm sure he's a wonderful law professor and a great advocate for civil rights causes. But he was put in charge of measurement. And I just think that this is not, this measurement doesn't work. And I think they have to go back to the drawing boards. They put, they put e more emphasis on progress than on performance. So you could be a very high performing school, and if the percent of kids that pass the reading test went down by 5%, right. you go from Even being though, an A to being right. a D. Okay. A grade, an overall grade, and then, then briefly give me a criteria. Well, I'd have to say that if you judge them for progress, as they judge schools, you'd have to give them a D. What about performance? For performance? The New York City schools were uh, actually high, compared to other big city schools, were relatively high performing schools when they came, and they're doing about the same today. On the NAEP test, they come in about third in the nation, okay. as they did in 2002. So it's, it's a solid B. Thank you, Diane. That's it for the first of two conversations with Diane Ravitch. Join us next week. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.